Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here. And I've come from a very warm place to a very cold place. And believe me, it's worth every bit of it just to spend some time in the library and in the art gallery, and then to uh, see some old friends that I haven't seen in a long time and to meet new friends, including my limo driver who brought me from the airport and decided to stay a while. And we enjoyed visiting here. And so he was very impressed with everything he saw and plans to come back. And I can see why. It's just such a good feeling to be here. And thank everybody for coming out on this winter night. Um, tonight we're going to talk about something that's very hard to find out anything about. And uh, I've heard so many comments as you came in saying, I don't know anything about the Cathars. I'd like to know more, but I can't find out anything. Well, it's a, it's a hard topic to find out anything about, which is surprising because you get bits and pieces of information in so many places, like Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code. As soon as everybody read it, they started talking about the Cathars. But they still didn't know a lot about them, except uh, they were definitely the guardians of the bloodline of Jesus and all that. But I had already been obsessing about these people for several years, and I'll tell you when it started for me. About 20 years ago, I was in a mental hospital in New Orleans. I should tell you I worked there, and that's why I was there. <laughs> so, <laughs> some people are suspicious already. But <laughs> as an employee, part of my job was to go to the different units and visit, and my favorite unit to visit on was the uh, drug rehab unit. And I like going there because I met a lot of really interesting celebrities and politicians, and I heard some good stories. And I went one night, it was a visiting night, and I was just checking up to make sure everything was going okay. And there was a group in the common room where everybody met to visit. And there was a man telling a story about his ancestry. And I'm a sucker for a good story. And when that story's being told with a Cajun accent, I'm there. Well, this Cajun man had uh, been answering the question about what are Cajuns. And he was telling a little bit about where the name came from and everything. And then he said, but I'm not like other Cajuns. My family were Cathar, who survived the Inquisition and hid out among the Acadians as they migrated to Nova Scotia. And then later we ended up here in the bayous of Louisiana. And he said, we're a little different because we go to the Catholic Church like they do. And we have the Mass and so forth. But we have a chapel at our house. And when we come home to our house, some of the other Cathars will come to our house and we'll have our own worship and our own mass as Cathars. And everybody had questions and I, well, I had to work. I couldn't sit there listening to him all night, so I had to leave, but it haunted me. When I got through with what I had to do, I went back and he was gone, and which told me he wasn't a patient or else he'd escaped or something, but I couldn't find him ever again to ask questions. But that was 20 years ago. And that was a subject that just stayed with me. I, you know, At that time, you won't believe this, but there was no Google, no Wikipedia, the Stone Ages or something. But you couldn't, you couldn't find out anything that way. If you wanted to learn anything, you had this archaic <coughs> method of going to a library or reading a book or asking questions. Well, I'll tell you what, if you go to the library, try to find out something, you get little bits and pieces, and some of it's very negative. Because the reality is, if you're a defeated people, the people who defeated you get to define you. They record your history. So I did learn that the Cathars were a Gnostic sect. And then when I start looking in Gnosticism, what, what were the Gnostics? Have you ever done that and found out some of these really horrific things? The Gnostics ate babies and all sorts of things like that. <laughs> if you really believed some of the things that were written, you would approve of the fact that, maybe you would, that thousands of people a day got burned to death as martyrs because they belonged to a Gnostic sect. <coughs> but remember, the people who defeated them got to define them. So. If you start really looking around, you'll find that there were uh, the Mandeans, the Manichaeans, all these different sects. But then the 
the Gnostic sect that really stands out at that period of time that we were studying were the Cathars. And I tried to learn as much as I could in this country and figuring out who they were because I was kind of obsessed with this idea. You know, once you get something in your head, and you know, we have these little synchronistic meetings with people or an idea will come up. Things happen in your life that will change your life. And you never can let it go. It will, it will drive you crazy until you keep digging, until you find out something. People got really tired of hearing me talk about who are the Cathars and what are they. And then, you know, Holy Blood, Holy Grail came out. He had a few things to tell us that, that said uh, who they were and gave us a more positive idea. But I couldn't find out what I needed to know until I went to France. And I had a little help because my husband was born in Chalon on the Marne, and he has a family there, and they were interested in these things. So going there and spending time with them and having my husband's uncle put together an itinerary that took us to various places that he thought would be good for me to go. And I can't tell you how exciting it was for me after years of being obsessed with Cathars to go down the coast into the south of France and see a big sign that said Cathar country. Boy, <laughs> you talk about the Holy Grail. I had found it. I, you know, I was so happy to see that sign. And I knew it was there. I'd, I'd heard talk about going to Cathar country. I just didn't expect this big sign that said, you're here. But I knew, now I'm going to find out some things I needed to know. But I wasn't prepared for some of the things I did learn. I started learning about myself and what I believed, what I felt, what I knew to be true. I called myself a Christian. Um, I had some arguments in my family because my brand of Christianity didn't fit some things. I was raised by a Cherokee mom and a father who was of Scottish heritage and had uh, the Christian background, but it was more of a social thing. And I was steeped in, uh, well, what some people call the pagan ways of the Cherokee, which had to do with everything is one. We're all in this together. All of life is entangled. If uh, you pull one thread, you affect everybody else in this whole pattern of humanity and of all life. Well, I believed that. And it didn't really fit in with my Episcopalian background, but you know, I still said I'm, a, I'm an Indian Christian kind of person. Well, I was to find out that I wasn't the first one to think all things are in a tangle. Everything is connected. Everything is one. And to understand that it doesn't end here. It goes on eternally. And, you know, I wasn't the only one thinking that. A lot of people had this idea. And as I, uh, the first stop we made was in Narbonne. Now, only one person here has read Promised Child. But as I was trying to learn about these people, I knew 20 years ago I was going to write a book. And my book was going to have a hero who was a Cajun, Cathar, who for some reason had to be hidden out in, in the swamps of Louisiana for generations until he could claim his heritage. And I had this man in my mind. I could picture him. He was going to be my hero in this book. Well, I wrote other books, and they got published. And I'm going around doing book signings. And people are saying, well, how's the Cathar book coming? And I hated that question, because I struggled with that book year after year after year. I'd write a few chapters, and I'd delete them. I have a stack of this book that high that never will see the light of day because it didn't work. I might pull bits of it out and do something with it. But I'm looking at history that goes back to the time of Christ and before, all the way up till today. So how do you write a book like that? But all the time I said, I'm going to write a book. It's going to have a Cathar man who's a Cajun. Well, when I went to France, I was determined. I'm, what I learn here is going to help me to write this man's story. And I'm in Cathar country, and I'm in Narbonne. And the first thing I knew when I got there, this is a place of refuge for the people in my book. This is where they go to be safe. 
And I knew that. I didn't know how it was going to work out. But I had a vision in my head of this chalet that was where a lot of things would happen in the book, and it would be in Narbonne. But my uncle-in-law had said, don't stop there. You've got to go on. Go spend some time in Carcassonne. Go to Rennes le Chateau. Go to Montsegur. Go to all these places. Well, I mean, have you ever traveled and you have this feeling when you're at a place? I've been here before. I know this story. As we went down and we stopped in Montpellier, and we had plans in a restaurant. We wanted to go and have a nice lunch and spend some time walking around. And I got out of the car and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't walk in that town. I just, I couldn't stay. And my husband is saying, are you sick? What's wrong? Should we go back home? I, I just wanted to get in the car and go. When we left that town, I was OK. And then I got out my little guidebook. And it talked about how on one day, tw uh, 2,500 Cathars were gathered up and put in a fire and burned to death. And that the bishop who led this revolt had said that he was asked, how do we know they're all Cathari? And he said, burn them all. God knows his own. So they burned them. And that was just the beginning. There were more and more of these massacres of women, men, children, because they didn't believe in the things that they were supposed to believe in. They were called heretics. Well, I learned they did have some very strange ideas. They felt that all of humanity was equal in God's eyes, that the uh, path to God was through knowledge, through wisdom, and that if everybody was going to seek this sacred knowledge, this gnosis, they had to be educated. And if you have an education, you should pass that on, even, get this, even to peasants. They were educating peasant people. The servant class, they were educating them. They were bringing them into their homes and teaching them to read and write and saying, study, hear the Gospels, read them. What do you think Jesus was saying? Who do you think God is? How's this, how's this affecting you? So and another big thing that they were not allowed to do, they had women who were teaching, who were calling themselves priests. God help them. Can you imagine such a thing? Woman, priest. But they really had these women, and they were called perfect or perfati in French. And the French call them perfati. And I'm learning about that they had these people, and I'm asking, you know, how did you become this? Well, what I found out was that you, you lived your life in your youth like any other person would. You should get married. You should have children. You should make money and uh, establish yourself and be secure because you don't only have your own family to take care of. You know, the way it was set up with the, the whole system that you had so many peasants that worked your land. And so you were responsible for all these people. But at some point, you're going to reach the, this realization, I've done what I need to do for the material self. All the things I do in the world of matter, I've done. Now I've come to a turning point. I'm serving God from here on out. This is my time to turn my life into the spiritual quest for this gnosis. Well, what you did when you reached that point, they, uh, they call it consolamentum. You took these vows. One of the vows were that uh, you, would be, you would be harmless in the world. You would not harm anything. You would not cause anything to be harmed, which meant that you were a vegetarian from then on. You didn't eat meat because you would have to harm an animal to eat meat or to cause that animal to be harmed. Another thing, uh, sexual propriety. At this time in France was uh, a party time, you know. A lot of, a lot of fun was had by all. And the uh, Cathars were not averse to having a lot of fun. The, um, there was a tradition in the Castle at Foix of having all the, uh, the troubadours and the songs and the dancing. And romantic love was wonderful. And you should fall in love and be in love with the one you're living with. And you're with that person out of love and devotion and raising your family. There's, that sexual romantic love was, uh, was accepted. 
Well, we know what the Catholic Church thought of that, so, and they were the boss. So you weren't supposed to do that, so here you got another thing. But when you reached consolamentum, you took this vow. This was not your primary thing in life anymore. You were a servant of God. So you took this vow. Uh, from what I could gather, they said it was celibacy, but it wasn't a strict celibacy. If you were going off from your wife and you came back, fine, that's okay. But you're not supposed to be promiscuous. It was celibate compared to the rest of France, let's put it that way. <laughs> and you were not ever supposed to lie. There were various vows that you took at that time, and you were devoted to serving God and serving your fellow man. And they donned the brown robes of the priest, and they went about the country doing good wherever they could. And since a lot of them had money, they would use some of the money to help the poor. If you needed help in your fields, that priest would help you in your field. He didn't go to your home to ask you for money, and he didn't go and find robes and, and all the, the garb of the priesthood. He went as an humble, monk-like figure, and he went in a very loving way to do all he could to help everybody. The people liked that. They could see the difference in these Cathar, Perfati, and the way the, the church would send people out in uh, caravans of uh, the finery and the horses and the servants and take up half the food in the town just to feed this retinue. But the uh, Cathar priests, they would go to your town and they would do things for you. Now the women, it was a little harder for them to travel, but women were Cathari priests as well. They would take consolamentum and take these same vows, don the robes of the priest, and a lot of times they would start Cathar schools in their home. Because if you could come to their home, you live around there, you could go to their home, you could learn to read and write, and they could teach you and you uh, the songs, the gospels. The, but the idea was that you t don't take these written words on face value. You look deeper because they were Gnostics. And a Gnostic looks for sacred knowledge beyond the written word. And Lao Tse says, um, the name that can be spoken is not the eternal name. The way that can be shown is not the constant way. To me, that sums up the, the idea that they had. You can't really define this sacred knowledge in a way that you can write it down or you can speak it. It's beyond that. It's much greater than anything that the, this material mind can comprehend. So they would teach people, take what you read and go beyond it. And a lot of things were written, and some of them were stories. And I tell people I'm a Gnostic teacher because I teach by telling stories. That story might be true. It might be totally made up. But you'll find something in it that will make you understand a little deeper who you are and what your journey is. So to me, that's the definition of what a Gnostic was doing. They're teaching, but they're teaching you to open your mind, to find what's within you. Now, one thing I learned that blew me away, we went to Carcassonne, and if you've never been there, it's, it's a medieval village, and the walls are still there, the castle is there, you can go into this Cathar church and you see the carvings that show the attacks from the church and uh, the, the, uh, the, the massacres, or, you know, all the really horrible things that were happening because these people were caught up in an inquisition against them. You can't imagine how horrendous that is until you've gone to the places and you've been told that's the spot where they burned to death 500 people in one day men, women, and children. If you came afoul of the Inquisition, then you were in danger of uh, a really horrible death. They could, you didn't, uh, it's not uh, innocent until proven guilty. You're guilty until they can torture you badly enough to make you recant what you believe, then they'll kill you. So that's what they had to look forward to. So in Carcassonne, you see evidence of all this, and you hear stories of the siege of Carcassonne and uh, how it fell and, you know, all the, the really bad things that happened to these people. So still kind of reeling for that. We go wandering on till we, um, we were looking for Rennes-le-Chateau. And the thing is, all the maps we got had nothing about Rennes-le-Chateau on them. 
This is something that Dan Brown wrote about. All the books have it. So I thought there would be big arrows pointing everywhere. But uh, we couldn't find anything, and it was not on the maps we had. So we decided that my mother-in-law wanted water from Lourdes, so we would go to Lourdes. We'll get her water, and then we'll find out. Well, we start toward Lourdes, and we see this little sign that says, Rin Le Chateau. So we go up this mountain, curvy mountain road, and my husband was having the best time in our little rented car. You know, those tiny little cars they have in France, and all these curves, and he got in a race with a Mercedes going up and down the hill, so he was having a great time. By the time I got there, I was a little bit nervous, thinking, well, I'm going to die right here. But we got there, and see, my husband was raised Catholic and never really cared about all this other thing. He was just raised Catholic. He knew what a church was supposed to look like. I knew what he was going to find in Rene Le Chateau. So wicked little me, I thought, well, honey, it's a church. You'll like it. It's a very old church. Right away, he sees the, this is a terrible place written over the door, and he couldn't, well, what, what is that about, you know? That would kind of freak him out a little bit. Then just inside the door, there's this demonic-looking creature with this big bowl on his head, bent on under it. And he says, that's horrible. Why would that be in a church? So he's already kind of having a little freak-out fit going on before he got in. And we got in the church, and he's walking around, and he looked up at the front, and he said, wait a minute, that's, that's Mary Magdalene. That's not the Blessed Mother on that picture. That's Mary Magdalene. And there's a skull under her dress. What's that about? And I said, what do you think, Jack? And he's, I don't know. And he's looking at all the, the stained glass windows, so I'm seeing this through his eye, how a good Catholic boy who's, he calls himself a recovering Catholic now. But he's seeing all these windows and the story these windows tell. And he came on around and he's looking. And there's a figure of a male on this side. It looks a lot like Jesus. And on the other side is a figure of a woman. They're both holding children. And, I, and he said, look at that. And I said, what do you think it is, hon? He says, that's Jesus and Mary Magdalene with their children. I'm going, yeah, that's kind of how I took it. So by then, we're both in this very contemplative mood. We're walking around the church and around the grounds. And I wandered out uh, where Abby Sonnier and the housekeeper were buried. I think they've moved the graves now because people were vandalizing it and taking dirt or whatever. But I was standing by the grave and looking around in the cemetery. And this little group of women came. There were five women, and it's kind of a misty day, so we're all under our umbrellas. And these women were talking, and there was a, an English woman who didn't understand French, and the rest were French. A French woman was translating to her in English. And their discussion had to do with when, uh, when they would know for sure who they were. And that really intrigued me, so I eavesdropped. And my excuse is I'm a writer and you eavesdrop on people because that's the only way you really know how to write about people. You tune into who they are. So I just edged over and I'm listening and I'm going to be very unobtrusive and just listen. But they kept talking about, we know that we're back, but how do we know who we are and what we're supposed to do and what it's all about? And one of the women said, we'll know under the moon. Well, how can I stand there and not know what that was all about? So I walked up and I said, excuse me, I'm just visiting here and I heard what you're saying and I find it very intriguing. Can you tell me about it? Well, the uh, woman who spoke English was saying, uh, yeah, we, we know that we are returning Cathars. And I said, tell me, what, what do you mean? She says, well, the Cathars believed in the transmigration of the soul. And it's the time for us to come back. It's the time for the reborn. And I said, what do you mean, it's the time? And she said, it's when Guillaume B. Le Baste said, we're getting into that time, and we know it's going to be that, that we've already been born again, and we've come back to finish what we started. We're the returning martyred Kathari. And I said, who said that? And she said, the last 
Cathar Prophati that we know of, who was burned at the stake. His last words were from the stake as he was being burned, was when 700 years have passed, the leaves of the bay tree will turn green again. And that just, when she said that, it was just something came like a wind or something. I just felt this chill. And I knew I had my first chapter of my book. I had to find out about this man because I know he was the opening of what I had to write about, that my Cajun Cathar hero couldn't come in until I told the story of Guillaume Bilabaste. And the story, his story was that he, you know, he was slandered a lot and people said bad things about him, but in the reality, he was a very good man who did what he was supposed to do as a Cathar perfect. He traveled around doing what he could do. Well, the church kept trying to find him. They knew, but nobody would rat him out. They couldn't find him. Well, they had a way of catching these uh, Prafati. They know that you couldn't kill anything. So they would tell them to kill something. They were, they'd ask this man to kill chickens, and he refused. So on that basis, they decided, you know, he'd rather risk his life than kill a chicken. He must be a Prafati. So they arrested him. And in the end, he was burned to the stake. Well, he was telling his people at that time, we'll be back, and he gave a specific time. His uh, martyrdom was uh, in uh, 1321. So 700 years are approaching the close. So I knew this is something important. When I heard about him, I knew that was something important. But then I asked her, well, how you said you would know soon who and what you were. And she said, the alignment of the moon. And I said, so what alignment? And she explained to me that there would be a night on a full moon and a lunar eclipse that the moon would align with the planets until it formed a six-pointed star in the sky. And on that night, they would remember. It would come back to them who they were. They would, in dreams or memories or somehow, they would know that all these returning martyrs would have those memories back and know what their work was in this life because they'd come back to complete what they started. Well, I don't know anything about astrology or astronomy, but I have a good friend back home who is a good astrologer. So I got in touch with her and I said, Susan, check this out. See if there's ever going to be a night when there's a full moon and a lunar eclipse and the moon's going to align with the stars and form a six-pointed star in the sky. Well, she didn't know anything about it, but she said, I'll check on it. Well, by the time I got home, I had an email waiting, and she said, uh, November 8, 2003, will be this moon. And it's called the Cathar moon. So I'm going, holy cow, I'm on to something here. So I knew that was, that was my opening. Well, I kept going on with this and learning more, and my next stop was going to be Monsegur. And getting to Monsegur is an interesting trip, too. You go straight up this mountain, and you get to the top of this unscalable mountain. I mean, it's, we have mountains here. I grew up in the Smokies, and I thought we had some pretty good mountains. But these mountains just make ours look like anthills. But these, we go up to the top of this mountain. And then on the top of this mountain is what they call the pog, that rounded pog on top of the hill, on top of the mountain. And that's very steep. It goes down hundreds of feet. And then on top of that is a huge castle. Now, uh, Lady Escromont from Foix, the castle at Foix, where they had all the good parties, she was a Cathar. And she decided that uh, we're being attacked all over the place. We need a place where we can go to that's an impenetrable castle, that we can be safe, that we can have this security. So she had the castle at Montsegur built. And when you see that, you just can't imagine how anybody could climb down off the castle wall, scale that pog, and make their way down this rocky mountain to safety. But there's a story uh, that was believed by a lot of people, apparently, including Hitler, because he sent people to investigate this. But the story has to do with five men uh, during the siege of Monsegur when they were uh, surrounded by soldiers and the church and the Inquisition, 
and they were under siege until they ran out of food and water, and they're really in bad shape. Well, they sent five men down with the greatest treasure they had. They scaled that castle wall, climbed down that pog, went down the mountain, and escaped. And one of those men was known to have been seen later in Spain and a few other places where the other men were seen. So it was understood that they did live, they survived. And people would say they took the Cathar treasure, the gold, the chest of the treasure. And I'm thinking, that can't be the treasure. You couldn't get down that mountain with a cask of gold. You, that's impossible. Getting down it just with nothing is a chore. So I just, you know, you go into these meditative states as a writer, and you just, sometimes I wonder if it is some kind of psychic thing, because you get all these ideas that you feel like you must be insane to come up with these things. But I found what I thought was the treasure. And I, by this time, you know, I had already found the Nag Hammadi Gospels. I had the Nag Hammadi Library. And I learned while I was in France that there were many people who said that this greening of the bay tree began, and that was his way of saying we'll return. The Cathar people and the Gnostic faith will be revived. That, that greening of the bay tree. Some people say that the greening began in 1945 when the Nag Hammadi scrolls were found because these were the Gospels, some of the Gospels, that they believed, and those Gospels have been recovered. And there was a lot of effort to keep them from being translated. Of course, there, you know, there always is when something is knowledge that comes to the fore that's been uh, tried to, they've tried to keep it down. But this knowledge comes out, and I think Madame Blavatsky said at one time that if you took all the, the perennial wisdom in the world and did away with it, it would come back in the same form because it's true, and truth always survives. It comes out. It can be hidden, but it will out. So these Gospels came back, and the first time I got hold of uh, the Gospel of Thomas, I was just so excited. If you haven't read those, that one book, I mean, there's some of the, the uh, Nagama, Nagamati Gospels I don't understand at all. They're just very strange. But when I was reading the Gospel of Thomas, I thought, this is real. The things it said, you know, remember I work in mental health. And they have Jesus saying things like, if you bring out that which is within you, that which is within you will save you. If you don't bring out that which is within you, it will destroy you. Does that sound like it makes sense? Now, we learned that in first year psychology. You've got to bring this out. But it had a deeper meaning for the Cathars. We have within us all the knowledge. Um, there are... One of the things that um, the church was so angry at the Cathars about, there were several things. The women priests, and the fact that everybody liked them, the fact that they uh, didn't believe that you were going to hell when you die, so there's no real way of controlling people. You know, if you can't tell them, we can torment you all the days of your life, but if you try to get out of it, too bad, because when you die, you're just going to get even worse. So if you tell people you're going to live again, you lose a big control mechanism there. So they didn't like that. Another thing they didn't like was that, the, you know, this is a very material world to most religions and to the um, accepted Christian faith today. It's a very material world. They might say, I'll be glad when I go to heaven, but you try to urge them on a little bit and they'll fight you because they, you're really immersed in this life. And if you go to any, uh, you know, my husband talked about one thing that disturbed him as a child going to church was the crucifix and looking at that crucifix and the tormented, bleeding, dying Jesus dead on the cross and how depressing that was. It ended at the moment of death. It ended at death. The religion was based on the death of Jesus. Well, with the Cathar faith, it didn't end there. It ended with this joyful release from matter into spirit, that we were not just matter. And there was a, an image that got a lot of these people in trouble. 
And I think it's a beautiful image. I've seen it a few times. In fact, the little Episcopal church where I was ordained has a cross up in front. But Jesus is not nailed to the cross. He's out away from the cross, and he's wearing this crown, so the victorious Jesus. But the, the Gnostics had an image that really drove them crazy because not only is Jesus not really attached to the cross, he's released from the cross, he's laughing like he knows something they don't know. And they say it's their way of mocking the crucifixion. It was their way of saying the crucifixion is nothing. This is not the sacrifice. Coming into matter from perfection is the sacrifice because they saw this material world as something of a prison. And imagine if your spirit, you can move, you know everybody, everything this family thinks you're thinking and you're knowing and you're, you're intertwined with each other and you know that unity, that oneness with each other and with God and with all existence. You know that. And to imagine Jesus leaving that, coming down into this dense material world, leaving behind this paradise, they saw that as the sacrifice, the descent into matter. That our role as human beings is to redeem ourselves from this matter so we can go into the spirit. So they saw this as a good thing, that he was released from matter and he was back in spirit. And they would look at, you know, the thing, the worst thing about being trapped in matter is that the thing that traps us here, we love it so much. We love our life here. And when we think about something might come along and make us give it up, doesn't matter how much we talk about, I'm going to heaven, or I'm going to be in spirit. It's, we're not really ready, you know. Very few people, and I do a lot of work with uh, people who are dying, and they'll reach a point when, yeah, it's time. I'm ready to go now. But they build up to that. That first moment when you think I might die, uh-uh, you're going to fight it. So we, that was the, the way that they looked at it. We're in this world of matter, yearning to be back in the world of spirit and to continue this progression to perfection, to redeem this material world until we can be free from it eventually, get off the wheel of birth and death and be united as one with our source. And I don't say creator because that's another thing that got the Gnostics in trouble. Uh, the Cathars, you know, they didn't get into this part of it so much. But the Gnostics had one belief that just really was just awfully hard for them to take. They kind of felt that the church got it kind of backward. That who, who said you not to taste the tree of knowledge? Knowledge is a bad thing. Don't touch the tree of knowledge. Who said that? No, God. what did the serpent say? <laughs> Who said to them, don't touch the tree of knowledge. If you do so, you will die. The serpent said, no, you won't die. Knowledge doesn't kill. But you know what it did to? They didn't drop dead. But they did get kicked out of the garden. That thing of ignorance is bliss. That garden was great. They didn't have to worry about anything. They just lived in the garden. They didn't have any, any conflict. They didn't have to hunt for food. They didn't have to worry about anything. They were taken care of like pets. But the serpent said, go ahead and eat this fruit. Well, you know, uh, Carl Sagan wrote a book called Dragons in the Garden years ago, and it was one of those moments that opened a little thing in my head where he said, the reason, you know, God said that uh, to the woman that you, because of your disobedience, you will travail in childbirth. Well, you know, animals that have small brains have small heads, and childbirth is much easier. Take my word as a mother, our babies have big heads, and that's because they have to house a big brain. And so women travail in childbirth. That's one of the curses. Wisdom does cause some curses. Knowledge causes some difficulties. The search for knowledge is not an easy path. That search for wisdom keeps you going and drives you. And I think back to how I was driven to find out more about this group of people. Before I could write about them, I had to learn this. 
But that's another thing the church called them heretics for because they suspected that the light was a good thing. And they had a belief that uh, this creator force that was kind of keeping people like pets and uh, jealous and liked war, like discord, might have been the bad guy. So they taught some of that, and believe me, something like that today can really annoy the Catholic Church and any other church. Try talking like that in a Baptist church one day, see what happens. You might still get burned. But, you know, that, just beliefs like that. But it was a group of people that believed in thinking and of treating everybody as if they were human beings. Because in the uh, Gospel of Mary, when she's talking about uh, that, uh, Jesus had said, you know, uh, he would give her knowledge. And he asked that the disciples were kind of mad at him for, why do you love her more than us? And I like Jesus' answer. Why do I not love you as much as her? You know, I think Jesus could be a wise guy at times. You know, he sounded like some of my Yankee relatives, just smart answers at times. But it was like, huh, why don't I love you as much as I love her? Of course I love her more. She's my woman. That was the attitude that I picked up from that. But uh, he says, shall I make her a man? But he said, too, that, you know, the male shall become the female. The female shall become the male. And, every, you know, everybody's one. Everybody's going to live every life. So if you put down anybody because they're a different race, different color, different gender, different religion, we're all in this together, and we're all going to be that. You're going to learn a lesson by being the thing that you misunderstood and were confused about or whatever. You're going to learn from that. This whole thing of the transmigration of souls was about learning and growing in knowledge and that Gnostic wisdom that was the, the knowledge that uh, had to do with something beyond the limitations of the body. And we were talking today about limitations. In this physical, material world, there are so many limits placed on us. I will never have the time to do everything I want to do. If I lived to be 200, I would not have the time to do half the things I want to do. And I'm sure there are many of you that feel the same way. Think of all the places you want to go. The time is a big limitation. We're always limited by money. We're limited by help. But they knew that there was a, a, a place, a mental place, a spiritual place, whatever, that we could reach where there are no limits. Your mind can open up and just explode with this burst of knowledge. And I've had that happen a few times, and it's the most amazing thing. And we've all had it at times when you hear something that inspires you. And all at once your mind is saying, okay, if that's true, then this is true. Then this fits in there. And so all these tumblers fall into place. That's what they're talking about with Gnosis. And when they taught, uh, some of the stories, and one of them, you know, the things in the Old Testament, I'm, I'm working on some things with the Old Testament. Some of the stories that you, you don't ever hear in church, but they're just stories. And Jesus was a big storyteller. Everything he taught was with stories. He went around telling about the seeds and the sower and the Good Samaritan and all these things. But there's an old story that said the trees decided they wanted a king to rule over them. So they went to the olive tree, and these are the big cedar trees of Lebanon. They went to the olive tree and said, we want you to be our king. And he said, why should I bother with being your king when I, when I have a job of growing olives and providing oil and making people happy? And they went to the fig tree and said, would you be our king? And the fig tree said, no, I'm happy with uh, producing figs and giving people joy with my ripe fruit. They go to all these other trees and nobody wants to be their king. And they go to the brambles. They're down to the briars because they have nobody that will rule over them. And the briar said, sure, I'll be your king, and then the fire can come out of us and devour you. So it, what sense does that make? There's something in there There's a reason for that story to be told. Everybody's got their role in the world. That's one of the reasons you look at it. But then in the end of it, when I got to that end, I'm thinking, why would it end with fire coming out of the brambles and eating the trees of Lebanon? Why is that a good thing? But the big can be devoured by the small. 
there's destructive force, there's positive force in everything. So any of these stories that were told, you needed to go down level by level by level, find out what does this story mean? And it's not about finding out anything about that story. It's like a cone. It makes you think. It makes you use your brain and try to figure it out. And as you do that, your mind expands. So that was one of the things that I, and I was going to tell you about going to Mount Segur, and I got sidetracked. But we get up to the top of this mountain, and we stop, and there's a sign that directs us to the Place de Cremont. And that's the field that had just a lake of fire. And after the people had been under siege for a, a years, they were out of food, they were out of water, they were out of everything, and it was a matter of surrender or die. And they decided to just surrender. Well, the, uh, the bishop said, you know, you don't have to die. You can recant your belief, and you'll go free. And the strange thing is that a lot of the peasants came out and joined them. The soldiers that were uh, besieging them, some of them joined. And hand in hand, they walked down the mountain into this big fire pit, walked into the fire, and died. They didn't have to, but they had a belief that was so precious to them that they couldn't recant it. They chose to go into the fire rather than give up what they truly believed. Now, in this place of uh, the burning, there were people standing around, and you could tell yeah, there's nothing there to see. It's just the place. But there were, some of them were very moved. Some of them were just tourists. Like most of us Americans, we just go, huh, there it is. And that's where they did this. But there were some people standing there, and you could see that it was deeply meaningful. I asked a woman, you know, I, I said, this is, this is very touching. And she said, I died in that fire. And I got chills. And then I saw that people beside her were nodding. Mm, me too. And it's so strange that there are so many people you meet now. And I've heard that pilgrims go to that place, and they stand there and say, I remember. And they have these, a lot of people are coming out who are now saying, and I've gotten emails from people who say, I read Promised Child, and I want you to know that I'm remembering. And I didn't expect that. I wrote a novel. But the thing is, I did all this, and I traveled around in the south of France. I visited these places. And I talked to people and said, what do you know about the Cathars? And I had a few of them that said, well, we're Cathars. They thought they killed us all, but um, they didn't get us. You know, Some of us stayed alive. And my great-grandfather told us this and so forth. So they had stories to tell. And there was a time I was in a, a little gift shop, and I picked up one of the little medallions, because the Templars are big in that area. And the little medallion had the thing with the two Templars riding one horse. And I'm, I've always been curious about that, because they say it was because they were showing how poor they were. I don't believe that, because they were not poor. They were the richest people in Europe. They had all kind of money. And they wore armor. Why would they be on one poor horse? You know, they were heavy to start with. So I asked the man, what do you make of this? And he just smiled at me and he said, good and evil ride the same horse. Now that's a very Gnostic point of view because all things are, are one. You know, uh, the, the darkness and the light, you couldn't have one without the other. If you go out in the daytime and look for stars, you'll see the sun and you might see one very bright star. But you don't see the stars until the darkness comes, and then the night is full of light. So the darkness reveals the light, and that's one of the beliefs I had, that darkness and light, there's that duality. And they believed in a duality. They're, they're, everything was two, but everything existed as poles of opposites, and they vibrated to each other. The darkness and light vibrated to each other. If you were in a place of absolute light, you would be just as blind as if you were in a place of absolute darkness. They both have the same effect, but as they vibrate to each other, you reach a point when we're comfortable, 
we're not in the... One um, Gnostic told me, we're reaching the higher shadow. And I loved that because, you know, I talked about enlightenment and when are we going to be enlightened? And to me, that was getting up higher on this pole of opposites. And I was talking to this couple that said they were Gnostics. Well, they said we're reaching the higher shadow. So, you know, maybe that's where we are. But if, if all things are in poles of opposites, you can see how they're, they're vibrating in, to the highest aspect, each vibrating to its highest aspect. And we're trying to come together somehow. And you see that with just about everything, that everything is vibrating to each other. We have the weak force in physics and the strong force. One pushes apart, one pulls together. But in that, they find this equilibrium so we can exist. So we live in this state of opposites. So in duality, we have our life, and that's kind of what they believe, that there's good and evil. But you have, in our life, none of us are totally good, and none of us are totally evil. You have the different degrees. We have some people who are pretty evil. We have some people who are so good you don't want to hang out with them because they're just too good. So you, you have those differences, and that's that duality that they believed in. Everything exists in poles of opposites. And they had, you know, they had some pictures of, uh, like, um, the, the rooster-headed god. You know, He's a hideous-looking thing, but he was just a design. It's like a kid drew it. So, and you look at that, and uh, the um, Ashmedeoth, Ashmed, Ashmed, how do you say it, somebody? You know who I'm talking about, the god who is responsible for anger and, and rage and all the negative energies. Well, that's supposed to be that figure in Renle Chateau under the vat of holy water. Asmodeus, yeah, under that vat. So I, I asked somebody, you know, why is that? That's a hideous thing to have a font of holy water on. And he said, the evil always bows beneath good. So that was his way of explaining why that was there. And he said that so many people in this world have a lot to be angry about. And if you looked at all the things that have been done to your ancestors and stayed angry about it, you would live a pretty angry life. I mean, I'm, my mother was a Cherokee Indian. I grew up with stories of the removal. But the attitude was, we're, we're good now. We've got our land back. We're, we're happy. A lot of us survive when we tell our story. But if we stayed in that angry mode, we would not be victorious. But that's being that, that anger, that God of anger, but that holy water represented the good. So that anger and that evil will bow beneath the power of the goodness that's in us. And that was the symbolism I was told that was a part of that. And I've never read anything that told me any different or that explained it to me in any other way. That's the only explanation I've ever had for that. And if you've ever seen it or seen a picture of it, it's confusing. You know, as an Episcopalian girl, I'd look at that. If I'd walked into um, St. Philip's Cathedral and seen a thing like that, I might have left because it's so out of place. But when you think of it that way, it tells its own story. And this was all about telling its story because it opens your mind and makes you think. And when you open your mind and think, that's your shot at having this Gnostic experience. Well, when I finished this trip, and I came home and started writing, and I still wanted to put this man who was a Cajun, who was a Cathar, until, now I'm going to tell you something that's just too weird. I shouldn't even tell you this because it is just bizarre. So don't tell anybody. But I have this friend down in Jacksonville, Florida, who used to be an editor for the ARE Press, and she's uh, involved with the Edgar Casey <laughs> Institute. So she's uh, one of these people I can talk about all the weird things that go on. And she knew how I'd struggled for 20 years with that. And being an editor, she knew I'd written several other books while I was writing this one and couldn't get it. And this is the book I had to write, and I couldn't. And so she said, Holly, I'm taking you to Washington. I want you to meet this friend of mine, Dr. Barbara Lane. And we're going to get to the bottom of this. Well, I knew who Barbara Lane was. She'd written a lot of books on hypnosis and reincarnation. And I 
just balked at it, but I, I said, you know, I, a lot of people have tried to hypnotize me. It can't be done. I've never been hypnotized. And I've tried. I wanted to be. But it couldn't happen. But she says, let's go see Brenda. Let's go see Barbara. So we went up to D.C. and we visited a friend and Barbara came over. And so the idea that all of us were going to have Barbara hypnotize us and do a past life regression. And I said, let me go first because I won't be long because I can't be hypnotized and I'll get out of the way and you guys can go. I laid down on the little sofa and she put the microphone that she uses, a real good recording system and all. And in no time at all, I was in another place. I was watching this young woman on a hillside with a little baby crying and taking her to the shepherd's hut, taking that little baby, her son, to the shepherd's hut. It was just a little stone thing on the side of the mountain, crying because she was leaving her child there, because her child would be safe, because they said that no one would look for him in the hut of these shepherds. From now on, he'll be the shepherd's son. And I watched all this just like I was watching a movie, and I saw all these things happen. And I kept seeing scenes of, this, of women and their babies, giving their babies away to have them taken care of because they'd be safe, and crying as they left those babies. And those scenes went on and on until when Barbara brought me out of it, I was just so sad and depressed. And she had that recording. And 4 o'clock in the morning, we're still sitting there talking. And she said, Holly, I think we need to try another session. I'm going, not in this lifetime. I've had it. So, but I took that recording that she had done, and I took it home. And I had my book. Within three months, that book was done. And my heroine was a Cajun who was in New Orleans or in the Louisiana bayous. But it was a woman named Grace. And Grace was there for a reason. She was a 21-year-old woman who was discovered and ended up trapped between her friends and enemies. And of course, she had a child that had to be rescued. And she had to help rescue this child because that was the whole. But out of all this travel and out of all this research, I found who my people were in this book. And I ended up with a little book. You can see the little black book there, a message from Annalise. Annalise was uh, a, 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 a priest. She, was, she would have been a Cathar priest. And she was a traveler and a teacher. And she was the expert in the Cathar faith. And she's the one who wrote the book that Grace read in the book to find out about who she was and what her faith was. So that had to come first. That had to be written because... It had to be there before the book could be produced because I had to know the people. I had to know what they believed. But once I got that, it took three months to finish that book. I wrote that book and not one thing in it was there before that because it didn't work. I had to learn who my people were. I had to learn my character. But it ended up being what it was supposed to be. And in doing that, you know, these, these moments that we have in life, that change us forever. If I hadn't met that Cajun man in that mental hospital telling this weird story, which may or may not be true because it was in a psych, you know, in a psych hospital in a drug and alcohol ward. So I'm choosing to believe it was true because he had that attitude about him that made me believe it. If I hadn't run across him at that time, I would have been content to just believe what I believed, which was kind of a melange of different things. But I would not have discovered what my version of the Christian faith was. I wouldn't be a priest today because I wouldn't have found what I need. And there were things that I've done since my priesthood that have made a big difference, not just to me, but to other people. And I, I can look at that and think, that would not have happened if I hadn't had that encounter with that Cajun man 20-some years ago, and paid attention and let it affect my life. And we have these encounters all the time, don't we? These synchronicities. And if you look back in your life, you'll find something that hit you and made you awake, made you pay attention. And most of the time, we can manage to ignore it. 
But when you do have one of these moments, one of these encounters, and you can pay attention and follow the journey wherever it leads you, I can tell you that it can lead you to some amazing places. And I can't wait to start the next journey. And I hope I can come back in a few years and tell you what that's going to be. So, and I think we're supposed to have some time for questions and answers, right? If anybody has questions. Yes. Oh. We'll wait for the microphone. Um, I got obsessed with them about 20 years ago, just like you did, except mm -hmm. that mine was, I found a book at the Quest bookstore called The Cathars and Reincarnation. Right. Could you put it closer to this? Do I have to? I was fascinated mm -hmm. with them. I've read every word I can find on them. Um, the thing that really interests me about them was that they seem to be studying the mind. Right. They were right. very big on things like telepathy, mm -hmm. um, meditation. They could put themselves in a trance and they wouldn't feel the flames. Right. I heard that too. They were far ahead of their times in mm -hmm. that regard. But the thing that, that's the thing that fascinates me and I wondered what you'd found out about that. But in addition, I was wondering, what do you think it is that they seem to have gone underground with the crushing by the Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. But you say they just they are they made their way to Nova Scotia. That uh, man that I met in New Orleans—that's where that he had, said he came from. He said that his ancestors were Cathari, who had uh, escaped the Inquisition. And they migrated to Nova Scotia with the Acadians. And he told about how, you know, we came down to the bayous of Louisiana as Cajuns. I see. But he said, well, not all the Cajuns were Cathar, but they were a, a, a little group among the Cathar, he said. I see. Okay. Well, the other thing was, why do you think they've stayed underground for so long? I mean, I know the Catholic Church still has power, but... The Catholic Church doesn't have anything like the power it did since right. Martin Luther and the others came about. Why didn't Why didn't it just reappear? And I think itself? they are, uh, from the the emails I get and for the, from the things people tell me. Uh, people are coming out and saying I am Cathar, and if you go to France, there um, you know there's a, a festival in one of the towns where they celebrate uh, uh, the holiday of. Um, Elizabeth the Egyptian, uh, and you know who she is, that she, she came from Egypt and with the, the Magdalene as a servant. Mm -hmm. But there are some who say that she was not a servant. This was the disguise to protect her and that she was the offspring of the Magdalene and Jesus. Yeah. So that's Sarah. what I, you know, I, I heard them saying that when I was there. I heard about that. And so I used that in Promised Child. Is that the, the Black Madonna? Right, right. That so she was uh, disguised. The, the, I think she was Sarah. Mm -hmm. was she was Sarah she was, the Egyptian. Okay, yeah. and she was actually the daughter of Jesus. Right. And, Mary and uh, I had read somewhere that uh, he had a, a son named Jesus Justice and a daughter named Tamar. And uh, you know that that name Tamar continued. Uh, there was a Russian queen Tamar who had as her. Uh, flag, the Jerusalem cross, and some of the symbols in, in, her, uh, in her flag seemed to be uh, Gnostic, and there were rumors that she was a descendant. She was, you know, not one of the Merovingians. But uh, what I've also found that a lot of people say that if it's out front, you know, like everybody's talking about the Templars were the, uh, the ones who protected the, the lineage and everything. Um, what I was told was that if it's out front and everybody sees it, it's not the real thing. It's the, it's the shadow of the real. The real hides behind that. So I stayed away from anything people know, like the Templars. I kept away from that. Because, uh, you know, when you start writing a book, you have to ask questions, what if? And my question was, what if that bloodline legend is true? How long has it been going on, number one? And if you read in the Bible, the begets, it goes back to the beginning of time, and everybody begets somebody else. 
and it comes up to David, and then it comes up to Jesus, or it comes up to Mary. Well, that lineage started before, and it continued. So if that's true, who would be taking care of it? There would be somebody that would know, because it's too precious a thing to just ignore. And you have families that, I mean, my dad's family can trace the bloodline back a long, long way, and that's with all the migrations and Inner, you know, marrying people from all over the world and everything, but you still can trace your bloodline back. If you were the descendant of Jesus, you would definitely keep up with that, I should think. So, uh, you know, I think that, to answer your question, I think some of them are coming out. And some of the uh, Gnostic churches now, there are several Gnostic churches that are doing quite well. Do you think that the, uh, the treasure that they took down from Montsegur was actually just themselves and the knowledge that they had? Well, I, you know, as a, there are things that you can't find an actual answer to. So you have to go into your mind as an author and you start thinking, what would it be? And you read in the, uh, uh, the Gospels where he told her things he told no other. And when I was in that uh, trance or whatever, when Barbara Lane hypnotized me and made me watch all these things, I see this woman sitting there with parchment and writing and giving it to people who treat it like a precious treasure and taking it and putting it in this big box. And I remembered he taught her things he told no other. What if she wrote this down? That would be something to really be a treasure. So in my book I have that, the, the Magdalene key, the Magdalene uh, parchments as the thing that's the big treasure, and also that when the descendants gave birth and that the baby was taken to safety. Because there's a whole, you know, when you're looking at a bloodline, babies are so important. And when a baby comes along, especially when you're under siege like that, and one of the people who would be a, a member of that bloodline gives birth, you would definitely take that. That would be a treasure. So. I just decided to put that in the book. I don't know that this is true, but it's one of those things that when I was in that hypnotized state, and when you're hypnotized, it opens up all these chambers in your mind, and it allows you to think with more of your brain than you normally would. And I, you know, the people that were there with me said, Holly, I think you're the Magdalene, and I said, no, I'm not. I didn't see me in any of those people. It was just like me watching them. It was that state when you're in the hypnotic state where everything in your mind opens up and you see everything. And you're just aware And what I could gather in that state. And maybe it's that author part of my mind that can make up things a lot better when I'm hypnotized. But in that state, I saw that there was that book. And I saw what the book looked like. And I saw the young red-haired girl have a baby and uh, go with the rest of the people down the hill. But her baby wasn't with her and that the shepherd's son had gone down the side of the, the, the castle wall with the baby, and that another man had the book. So the baby and the book were the treasure in the way I saw it in that hypnotized state. So you take that. According to the Gnostic way of thinking, we're all in tune, like you said. We use more of our mind than we're willing to use. We see all times, all places. So. If I was asking a good Gnostic what happened to me that time, they would say, your mind opened up and you saw. So, uh, and I think of uh, one of the things our priest said in the little Episcopal church I go to. We have this very liberal bishop who was elected, and we'll see how long he lives, but, you know, I hope he makes it. <laughs> He's a very nice man. But he pointed out, he said, when Jesus was here, he didn't say, I've got the absolute truth, and you better listen to me, and you're going to hell, and you're going to hell, and you're very close. He said, come and see. And I thought, that's wonderful. Come and see. That could mean a lot of things. And maybe that's what that's about. Come and see. If you open your mind, maybe you'll see something that you couldn't see with this closed, condemning, judgmental mind that most religious people tend to have. So. Uh, Maybe that's all, what it's all about. Open your mind and you'll see. Okay, next. Did somebody else had their hand up. Uh, in your research, France seems to be a fascinating 
mm-hmm. place for religion. Oh, yes. Uh, in your research, have you seen anything connecting Joan of Arc to uh, the Cathars or Templars? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I didn't find anything about her. What I did find, you talk about the south of France being uh, a fascinating place. At that time, uh, you had a lot of different people that had come together and were communicating. You had the, the pagans that were there, because there's, you see all these uh, places that you know were centers of goddess worship. And then you had uh, this, there was a, a Kabbalistic school there, uh, Rabbi Rashi, who was a very learned man, who, who had a very mystical Jewish man, who had a school. And he taught the, the Jewish mysticism, he taught the Kabbalah. Then you had people from Eastern religions that were there. And then you had the, the Christians who were journeying over from the very earliest time, but uh, some say while Jesus was still alive, they would come and say, we've got this great teacher. So all these were coming together. And the Gnostics were living before Christianity. Uh, they embraced the message of this teacher. And they looked at him as the teacher. you know, and. They didn't look at him as this, uh, Jesus didn't say, I am the Son of God, I, you know, all these other things. They looked at him as a teacher who could come from spirit world and was aware that he was coming from the world of spirit and sacrificing that time to come into matter. And when you come into matter, you always risk getting trapped by it because, the, you know, it's a big sacrifice to come here. But the hardest thing is to allow yourself to be released from it. So it's a, it's a terrible trap. You can get trapped in the karma of this, this plane. So they saw that as the big sacrifice. And they saw him as a, a, a teacher, not, not any, you know, uh, everything was in threes. The, you know, we've always had the trinity in many different forms. So I can't say they didn't believe in that triune nature. But they, uh, they didn't believe Jesus and God and all. Um, the Holy Spirit was uh, that highest aspect, the great unborn, that highest aspect of you. That part of you that's never descended into matter, never known death, never known corruption. That we all have that highest aspect. And that was something that these people discussed and felt like this is the highest thing we can reach, the Holy Spirit. You discuss things with the Holy Spirit and it's one with you are... This is you. And so, you know, we are a triune nature. And they also, um, not just the Cathars, but a lot of uh, belief systems, said when these teachers came in, they came in with two other people, the two doves, they were called, the mother and the mate. So you look at how Jesus traveled with his mother and with the Magdalene. So, and you see that with Isis and Horus and Osiris and you know, and set, and you see how you have so, so many features of religions where there's this triune nature, but the great teachers came in with the two doves, the mother and the maid. So Jesus fit with that. So there was a lot going on in the south of France. There was one thing that was really horrible that they trapped some of the Cathars by doing this. Um, they had a really cute custom called slap the Jew, but with um, they would just grab some helpless Jewish person, take him to the square, and every good Christian was supposed to come and slug him to prove how much you hated people for killing Jesus. If you didn't do that, you were just not a good Christian. You had to you had to hit this Jewish person. So, you know, the Jews and the Cathars and all these people were friends, and maybe it was one of their buddies they took up to be on the slap the Jew day. So, you know, some of these customs, you look back and we're a Christian country, you know, and you look at the customs that were a part of that history and you would just be appalled. But it was a, an interesting time in the, in the world when these people came. They didn't it just come into existence then. They became big enough to be a, a thorn in the side of the church because people were leaving the church and becoming Cathar because people liked what they were doing. They liked the accepting, and they liked the, the studies, and the fact that they could learn to read, and that they didn't have to pay a priest to baptize their children to keep them out of hell. 
Anybody would do that. So everything was open and free. So tell me when to shut up, and otherwise I'll just keep going. <laughs> so, any more questions? Yeah. Any, 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 we have any one. We have one more question here, but we can wait for it. Just wait for the mic. Okay. Um, any particular books you would recommend? Uh, historical treatises and. Uh, well, just mine are the best, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay. All right. laughs> you can, I, I you can read mine. I if there's any disinterested books that you recommend, any others? <laughs> oh, good Lord, they're not any other good ones, just mine, that's okay. it. <laughs> no, there's some very good books. And go back to the old tried and true, uh, the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, gives a lot of the history of that part of the world and, and gives you a reason to keep looking for more which is, I think, very good. And then those two guys have more books that they, they are very, um, they study a lot. So, yeah, but mine are the best. <laughs> I won't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> I won't let you. <laughs> Someone uh, watching from home um, sent uh, a message and a question. I read Holly's book, Promised Child, which was great, by the way. As I read it, it had... Um, I had the sense that the Cathars are all reincarnating now in mass. Um, did Holly mean to convey that, that meaning, or did I invent that myself? And if we are reincarnating now, why does Holly think this is happening now? Uh, you know, it's a book of fiction. So it's got truth in it, but it's a book of fiction with history and fact laced in it. I met enough people who claim to be Cathar to feel that they are coming back and coming out of the woodwork. Some are just remembering that they had that Cathar lifetime. And that seems to be very prevalent. You know, when I go talk and uh, people read my book, this particular book, I get a lot of people come up to me and say, well, I don't remember uh, when it happened, if it was on that moon, but I started having Cathar dreams. and so. I don't know why it's happening now, except that there's a feeling of expectation now that something is in the air. We're having earth changes. Uh, we're having, we're just at that point in time when it's time for the human race to step up at a notch. Uh, the human brain is being uh, pushed to the limit. I mean, it, with technology, we can do things now that we couldn't do in the past. Our children know things that people my age are puzzled by. They just come into this world knowing things. Uh, kids, you know, there's just a change going on in humanity now. And every couple of thousand years, we do have a change. We have something that hits us that either hits us to another level of evolution or wipes out a bunch of people. So let's hope that this time what's happening is that we're learning. And we know that if we keep going with the things that we can do with technology and war now, we could kill us all very easily. And let's hope that we look at that and say we can change that and do something different. Rather than so destructive, we can take this technology and turn it into a positive thing. Because right now, we could uh, harness the technology we have uh, and cure most diseases. We can grow organs. We are unlocking the DNA code we're just so many things that we can do now that we couldn't do five years ago. So we're seeing some major changes. So it would be, in my opinion, a good time for something like a, a new religion, a new old religion, to come back. And, you know, Christianity is wonderful. I consider myself a Christian. But when I look at the history of the church, the, the dogma of the church, I have a terrible problem with that, and I couldn't be a part of a church that made me adhere to that. And I think more people are coming out and saying that. They are Cathar in spirit. I am a Cathar in spirit because I believe not in dogma but in truth. Uh, theosophy, there's no religion higher than truth. It's a religion of searching and of feeling like we're all connected, that we can't be separated, that there's this oneness of all life. And it goes back to uh, indigenous people all seem to have that. And it was something that uh, the mainline religions didn't even think about. 
in fact, you know, I've had people kind of make fun of my native ways because, like, when I was uh, working on my anthropology degree and doing a dig in archaeology, and I didn't want to disturb a grave, and my instructor says, Holly, you people think everything is sacred. And I started to argue with him and say, no. And then I thought, well, yeah, we do. Yeah. So what's wrong with that? Everything is sacred. So that's what we're getting to. The, this is a sacred world. It's a gift. And we are sacred beings. And what are we doing with it? So yeah, I think it's a good time for the Cathars to come back, because it fit right in with this new enlightened way that we can look at the world. And, it, and if more of them come back and talk about this holy gnosis, this knowledge, and the servants of the great light, rather than being afraid of the dark, maybe we'll have a better world. So let's hope they're back. Anybody else? I'd like to add to the, the man who said that uh, his Cajun people came over Nova Scotia because uh, I read some other research about a place there where there's tracks of the Templars landing on Oak Island in Nova right. Scotia. Right, yeah. So and that would have been about the same time frame. Like it would have, Shortly yeah. after 1300 yeah. so, or so that they came that way. Yeah. So if they came with a boat across that route right. and followed pretty much the route of the Vikings, Exactly. More so than Columbus. Yeah. Then they, uh, why wouldn't there have been some Cathars mm -hmm. with them? And I believe some of the Templars were indeed Cathars, but of course, right. some I were definitely too. not that as yeah. well. So right. <laughs> there are many kinds of, of all, all of those. It was all intertwined, you know? Yes, it is. And I, I think you're so. absolutely right. It would make all kinds of sense because if you were left in Europe at that time mm -hmm. and you were uh, from a group of people that the Inquisition was after, your first thought would be, how can I get out of here? Right. So if you got with another group of people and just blended in and then, you know. I have another question too. Um, you mentioned in your introduction the Celtic Cathars. So how do you combine these two cultures? Um, that was a misprint, I think, because oh, really? they're really right. not, <laughs> as far as we know, they're not combined. Uh, the Celtic church uh, kind of coexisted with the church in Rome, but for several hundred years, the church in Rome just kind of ignored the Celts because they were not really worth bothering with. <laughs> so, they were too far north and right. west and west. So they, um, <laughs> you know, the way the Celts were, they had their own religion. But if something came along that really uh, impressed them, they would adapt it and they would add it to their faith. So they had a brand of Christianity that was going on there that was more accepting and uh, they had, it, it was uh, a monastic life, but, you know, if a monk and a nun kind of got together and got married, they'd just live together. That was fine. So there was more, um, uh, more acceptance of the pagans, too. And there's a story of uh, uh, Colum Kiel, who was kind of a patron saint for me, Saint uh, Colum. But... He was traveling among the pagans, and he uh, was talking to a druid uh, priest, or druid chief, and telling him about Jesus and Christianity. And the druid said, I can't believe in that, because the Christians believe they hate the earth, and they, they, are, they consider the nature an enemy. And we druids consider the earth sacred, and uh, the nature is our friend. So how could you expect me to believe what you're saying? And he drew this circle on the ground and he said, this is the circle of life and we're all in it. So Colm drew a little cross through that circle. So you see the Celtic cross. And he said, the Jesus I'm talking about is the son of the creator of this earth and honors and reveres the earth because this is the place of the creator. You know, this is sacred to our faith, too. So they got along just fine. He was very much involved with the, the whole island of Iona, and the Scottish kings were buried there, and the, uh, the religion kind of spread out from there. And, of course, when Rome gets wind of the fact that this church is growing, and they came in and burnt them, too. They were good at that. They had, must have had a lot of firewood, I'm telling you. They just... <laughs> I also went to, to see many of the um, um, 
the dolmens, is that right. them, that, the, right. that are leftovers from the Celtic religion and from mm -hmm. the Druids. So when you talk about all these uh, mystical schools that existed in the area, the Druids were kind of another school that also right. existed at the same time. So, yeah. And so they're, they're all, all the wisdom of, skulls. And they had great respect for each other, as far exactly. as I understand, that they would kind of send their own apprentices right. between and say, I come from this school, I would like to go uh -huh. and learn in this and school. And can I go study at your school a while? Would you like a yeah. scholarship to mine? You're right. right. <laughs> so, yeah, and that was what made it so wonderful, because you had a melding of different uh, patterns of thought, different ways of life, and out of that came something wonderful. But that kind of thinking is a threat to people who want to control. Mm -hmm. uh, and when your, your aim is to control, you cannot allow people to continue to exist if they're thinking independently and if their leaders are saying, yeah, keep thinking. You're learning. That's a good thing. Now, how can we help you learn more? And you empower people that way. The power structures of government and religion are not about empowering. It's about control. So when you have a group of people that are all about empowering each other, you have a different story. And it's a very dangerous thing to the power structure. So maybe that's why they're not coming out, because we still have power structures that are threatened by knowledge. <laughs>